Hello everyone, I hope you're doing well. Today we are going to take our model into Substance Painter and begin texturing. So to start, I'm going to make a new project by clicking File, New. And the first thing you'll do here is select a template for your project. Each of these templates pertains to a particular output that you are aiming to export these textures to. So for example, so if you are making a model so that will really nice. be used for in Unreal, Unreal Engine, like you would Unreal want to start with the Unity. Unreal Engine template. So for today's purposes, I will be working with the ASN PBR Metallic Roughness SSS template. To break that down a little bit, PBR stands for Photo Based Rendering. So it basically just means it's going to look realistic. And SSS stands for Subsurface Scattering. After I've selected a template, I'm going to hit select and I'm going to look for my FBX of my character model. Next, I'm going to set the resolution for my textures, which I'll be exporting. I'm going to be using a 4K resolution. However, if you are running on a slower machine or if what you're making is meant to be run on slower machines or if you're working on a very small detail, that doesn't need a whole lot of resolution, then you may consider lower resolutions than 4K. Great, and I'm not gonna to touch anything else, and I'm just going to hit OK. So now my model is imported. Before doing anything else, I'm going to move this assets menu down to the bottom so that I can see a little better. To navigate around your model, simply hold Alt, and to rotate around, use your left click to pan you use your middle click and to zoom in and out use your right click and if you're not getting this mode with both screens you can go up here and access options for having just the 3d on or the 2d on or you can switch it to 2d and 3d together on the top right is your texture set list this lays out every material that you have set up in Maya, and it will show you all of the UVs that pertain to that material. So while you're working and you're painting, you can only work on the material that you have currently selected. So before we do anything else, I'm going to want to bake my mesh maps. Now, what are mesh maps? Mesh maps are a series of textures that Substance Painter can automatically generate, which gives a lot of useful data when using some of Substance Painter's various features, such as smart masks. So for example, one of the maps we'll be making is a curvature map. And what the curvature map does is it highlights all of the parts of the mesh, which are a sharp corner. Later on, we'll use a smart mask to automatically paint all of the corners in accordance to the curvature map. So to bake our mesh maps, we're gonna to go to texture set settings and we're gonna scroll down to the bottom and select bake mesh maps. And this menu will come up. It'll give us options for different maps we want to bake. I'm just going to leave these at this, the defaults and I'm going to raise the resolution. You don't necessarily need to have the resolution as large as your basic textures are. I'm going to go ahead and have them at half the resolution as my texture output. Uh, baking mesh maps takes a while, so if you're running on an older machine, you might want to think also about how long this will take, and you might want to have an even lower resolution. So when you're ready, go ahead and hit Bake Selected Textures. And I'm just going to let it sit for a minute. I've sped up the footage here, but on my machine, which is brand new, it took me about a minute to finish baking my mesh maps. Great. And now you can see it's baked out a bunch of these maps. And you don't necessarily need to know what they all do right away to get started. Just know that they'll be helpful for us later when we're working with smart materials and smart masks. I already talked about curvature. I'd also like to talk about ambit occlusion as well. The ambient occlusion is sort of like the opposite of curvature, where ambient occlusion looks for the crevices where two parts of the mesh meet together in a corner, and it simulates the effect of light losing strength as it bounces around in those corners. A lot of high quality software will do this automatically as well, as for example, Arnold has ambient occlusion. 
and game engines have a basic ambient occlusion system, but this adds an extra level of accuracy to your ambient occlusion. If you'd like, you can delete your mesh maps later on individual materials. So all you need to do is go over here and press this little X. And when I do that, all of my dark ambient occlusion disappears from my model. All right, now with my mesh maps baked, let's talk about layers. You can access your layers in the tab next to your texture set settings. There are a few different kinds of layers in Substance Painter, similar to Photoshop. First of all, we have the default, which is just a brush layer. And that just lets us paint on top of our model as if we were in Photoshop. We can also paint on the UV side if you want to get a flatter view. And then if we wanted to erase, we can use the erase tool over here and to erase our brush strokes. We want to change the properties of our brush. We just need to go down to the properties window below our layers window. And scrolling down to the bottom, we can find our base color for our brush. And that way we can paint with any color we want. We aren't limited to just color, more however, that we can, we change can also paint just our height map, our roughness, our, our metalness, just and our other various qualities of base our base color though. So if I go over here and we'll turn up my height, height value, so and then I, I go back to paint, a big height, and then start painting. Where I paint will see, appear elevated. Of and depth. once I'm done, Surface. this height information will be baked into both a height map and a normal map. And once I'm done and take this into Maya, I can choose which of the two I want to use. While you're painting, you can change the size of your brush up here, the top of your window, or you can hit the square bracket keys on your keyboard. I can lower my height as well. You can also adjust your roughness, making your texture appear more or less shiny. You can turn on metallic, which gives it a metal look, which would be more apparent if I turn my roughness back down. There we go. And then there's a the normal channel, but I'm not going to touch that for the brush settings for now. Aside from color and height and roughness, we can also scroll up, change the size of our brush here as well, as well as the flow. So it might not come out quite as quickly. So you can get a much softer effect. Or you can change your stroke opacity. Just like Photoshop. And then here we have sliders for adding jitter to various properties of our brush, which jitter basically means randomness in this context. So you can randomize the size or the flow or the angle of your brush. Next up, we have our alignment setting. And what alignment determines is how your brush will paint when going over seams in your UVs. The default alignment is tangent, which means your brush will always paint on both sides of your seam. Whereas if you have your alignment set to UV, when you paint, it will, your brush will not bleed over into the next shell unless the center of your pen is directly on that shell. The difference is subtle, but it can be really useful. Sometimes you need to be specific about which shell you are painting on and you don't want your paint to bleed over to the next shell. Other times, however, you'll want to leave Tangent on so that you can have that smooth transition over your seam. Next up, we have size space. And what size space does is it lets you pick between different modes which determine how large your brush will be. 
So in object mode, which is the default, your brush will remain the same size in relation to the size of your object that you're painting on. Whereas in viewport mode, your brush will stay the same size in relation to your viewport. So if you zoom in, your brush will actually be smaller. And then in texture mode, your brush will remain the same size throughout the whole texture. If your UVs are all the same size, then this shouldn't really be any different from object. But if you have some UVs that are some different sizes, then you may notice some differences between the two modes. If you want to change the direction of your lighting, you can hold shift and right click, and then you can turn the lighting around. So now I can paint from the back with full lighting. Coming back to our parameters, we can also change the hardness of our brush, like so. Get a much harder look. And if you want to reset all these settings back to default, there's a restore to default button just under hardness. And then down here, we have the stencil mode, which that allows us to basically apply a mask to our viewport. So for example, I'm going to select this heart and then I can paint in the stencil and it only paints within that area. Then once I'm done with my stencil, I can get rid of it by pressing the X right here. One more thing, if you want to paint symmetrically on your model, you can go up to here and press this button to turn on your symmetry painting. And then when you come in here, you can see you can paint on both sides symmetrically. And right next to that, you can press this button to activate your symmetry settings. From here, you can change different settings like which axis your symmetry is mirrored on or move where the symmetry line should be placed or change the color of your symmetry dividing line. So that's about everything you need to know for now about paint layers. Let's move on to fill layers. To create a fill layer, simply press the paint button icon up here at the top of your layers window. And you'll notice that all the same color settings from the brush mode also appear here as well. Unlike a brush layer, this cannot be painted in. So if I click in here, it'll actually give me a little pop up that says that I can't paint. But I can go over here and change my base color and it fills in the entire material. So let's say I have a fill layer, but I only want it to cover part of my material because for that part, I want to be able to change the color or roughness of it later without having to paint over it. Well, I can then add a mask using this button right here. Just like in Photoshop, I can mask out my layer so that only certain parts of the layer are visible. So I'm going to add a white mask. And masks can be painted on with the brush tool, but when you're painting on a mask, it is only going to use grayscale. So now with my brush set to black, I can come in and paint black onto my mask and it will hide anything that is painted with black. So anywhere where there is white, you will see your fill layer. Anywhere there is black, you will not see the fill layer. Anywhere with gray will be partially hidden. Now with that mask in, we can play with our settings and see how it affects just the fill layer. So if I adjust my height, anywhere that isn't masked out appears raised or lowered. Same with my metalness or roughness. And of course, just like in Photoshop, I can move these layers around so I can move my paint layer over that. And come in, paint on top. Of course, notice in my paint layer, if I change the color, it doesn't change the color of what I've already painted. Only in fill mode can you go back and change those colors. If you want to delete a mask, go ahead and select your mask portion of your layer and right click it. And then go over here to remove mask. You can also invert your mask. Or clear your mask. Or toggle it off 
on again. So let's get into what you can do with materials. So in your assets bar, we have several different tabs. We have materials, smart materials, smart masks, filters, brushes, alphas, textures, and environments. Uh, for now, let's just look at the materials. And these are basically presets of all different kinds of materials that you can just throw on and easily apply a certain kind of material to your mesh. So if you needed a wood color really fast, you could just throw it up and you instantly have wood on your character. And with this layer now, you can go into your properties window and change various properties specific to that material. Because this material is being generated rather than just slapped on from a simple texture, we have a lot more control over the final result of the material. Change your luminosity, contrast, hue shift, saturation. There's all kinds of sliders you can change with this. You will notice, however, that when working with just a regular material from the materials tab, you may have some really obvious seams show up. Now you could combat this perhaps by rotating this layer. Or perhaps you could scale the layer. And something like that might kind of hide the seam a little bit. However, if you want to hide it even further, you could try out different methods of projecting the textures onto your mesh. So over here in the fill properties window, the first drop down menu is your projection. The default mode for this is UV projection, where it lays out a texture flat and then it uses the UV shells to basically cut out parts of that texture and place them on the model. However, another mode we could use is triplanar projection. And triplanar projection could be thought of basically as taking a snapshot of the front, the side, and the back, and just blasting the texture directly onto the mesh that way. You will notice there are still some issues. If you get to the points where it transitions from the front to the side, you'll see that there is this sort of transition area between the front and the back where the texture doesn't totally line up, but it sort of fades into one another. So triplanar isn't perfect, but it's a good alternative. If those seams are bothering though, you could always try planar projection which is similar to triplanar, but it only projects from one direction. And that way there will be no seams. However, you may notice some stretching as it is only taking one view into consideration. Next up, we have sphere projection, which projects all around the mesh in a spherical shape. You'll probably get some weird results from this, but it might be what you're looking for. Similar to that, we have cylindrical projection, which projects all around the character, but just on one axis. Switching back over to planar projection, I'd like to also point out that you can transform any of these projection gizmos using your W, E, and R keys, just like you can in Maya, to rotate and scale and move around. So by rotating around this planar projection, I can get a direction that I want that is not just the flat straight across projection. If you're finding the material itself is not customizable enough, you could always use a smart material instead. Now, smart materials are a lot like regular materials, but they are comprised of a whole bunch of different fill layers, which take advantage of those baked mesh maps that we made earlier to create a semi-procedural texture. And so we can throw that on and it gives us another nice wood texture. And if you go over here to our layers panel, we can see it's actually a folder filled with fill layers. With this wood material open, I can start to 
look at all the different layers and find out what is doing what by simply turning on and off the visibility of certain things. So I'm just going through, turning off the dirt, turning off these different fiber layers, just seeing what kind of comprises this whole material. Turn everything off. Eventually, I'll just get down to this base layer. And each of these have settings. So I could change the contrast on this wood fibers large. Change the balance on it, perhaps. Every smart material is different, so just feel free to mess around and see what works for you. Now, if your character is very stylized, you don't necessarily have to use any of these materials. You can just go ahead and paint with nothing but your fill layer and brush layer, and that's totally fine. These materials are mostly if you want to get a bit more of a realistic appearance, or at least just a touch of realism to your characters, but they're by no means necessary. I kind of like this flannel texture. In fact, it's actually done some clever things with my seams. It actually looks like that's an intentional seam as if it were really on fabric. However, I'm going to go through and alter this by finding some of these layers that I don't really want and just turn off the visibility on them. Then I go to my base layer and just give it a different color. And then I go through all these other materials and try to find matching colors as well, while not getting the exact color as my base color. Next, I take a look at this folds layer, and it's adding a bit of height to my texture, which is great, but I think that it looks a little bit distracting with how sharp the folds are. So what I want to do is increase the blur strength on these folds. Now to do that, I'm going to access the filters attached to my folds layer. You can find them underneath. Uh, there's already two filters attached. One is called warp and one is called blur. So I'm going to go ahead and click blur. And from there, I can adjust my blur intensity. Real quick, I want to show you how to make your own filters. So to do that, go ahead and right click on a layer and then go down to the bottom where you can see add filter. And then once you've added your filter, go ahead and click this button and you can browse through all the different filters built into Substance Painter. So for example, I have selected an invert filter, which inverts my whole base mid layer. I could also select something like color balance to adjust the colors. Or I could do a clamp filter to clamp my values. There's a lot of useful filters, so I recommend taking some time to just experiment and play around with them. And you'll find that a lot of them resemble the sort of adjustment layers that you would get out of Photoshop. All right, so that's a start. Then if I want to come in and say, give this color a different color, I create a fill layer. Seems to have put that right in the middle of my material, which I didn't want. Put that right at the top. So I'm going to add a black mask so I can just get the collar. And I could paint this on the surface of my mesh. That's really messy. I'm getting a lot of my shirt in there. I could paint it on the UV side, but I'm still getting that. So I would then want to instead change my alignment to UV and I can paint on just the collar. And there's one way I can get my fill layer that way. I'll show you one more way though. Instead of using my brush, I'm going to use my polygon fill tool. What that lets me do is it lets me marquee select all these polygons and fill them with my white color. And then if I overshoot and fill in a polygon I didn't mean to, I can fill it back in with the black color to mask it out again. 
Notice though that when I marquee selected in the 3D view, it painted all the faces in my back as well. So oftentimes when you're using polygon fill, you want to be filling from the UV side and not the 3D side. Polygon fill works especially well when you want to fill in a certain area with a hard edge and you don't have separate UV shells for it. So sometimes when you are modeling, you can think ahead to how you are going to lay out your geometry so that you can use polygon fill to your advantage to quickly plot out sharp edges. Now, I haven't quite done that the way I want it to, but you can see how this can be applied. Now, you can see I still have some sharp edges here. So ultimately, if I wanted to have this kind of shape going along down the middle and down the sides, I would need to just paint it. But this does just act as a start if I want, because that is still painted on to the mask. If you're painting on a mask, you can press the X key on your keyboard to quickly swap between white and black, which is a lot faster than going back to the slider and adjusting it every time. If you want to draw a straight line, go ahead and click anywhere and then hold shift and then click again somewhere else to drag a straight line between the two points. If you like the settings from one fill layer you've been working on, you can duplicate that layer using right click and then duplicate. And then you can right click the mask and hit clear mask. And that way you can retain all the settings from your previous fill layer, but you can paint it in a different way while also retaining the ability to go back and change different settings like your color. I'm gonna go ahead and save now. I probably should have done that a bit earlier. So all you do is go up to File, Save, and you find a destination for your Substance Painter file. I'm gonna put it just above my character project. You could also make a folder called Substance and put it in your character project. That works too. Movie name, character, texturing. So let's say that's nice and all, but I'm not really a fan of this sort of hyper realistic look. I could also come in, and give it more of a painterly look. So I'm gonna turn off this flannel. I'm gonna keep everything else. I'm gonna do a new fill layer, give that a color, something like what we had before. I have to use my eyedropper tool actually select something in my layers as my color and there we go now I have just a very flat color going let's say I wanted to go further and I want all these sections to match because I think I changed in the settings so I'm gonna go to this fill layer go to the layer portion and I'm gonna turn on and off the different properties that are being affected by this fill layer so for example, if I had metallic on this layer, uh, but then I decided later I didn't want this fill layer to affect the metalness of the end result, I can go here and toggle off the metalness on this fill layer. And I'm gonna do the same for the normal and the scattering. So now that I've cleared myself a nice base, I am going to come back in with a brush and add some detailing. I want to have a more interesting brush than just the standard soft brush. So to access my brushes, I'm going to go to this button in my assets window. And here we have a whole host of options, just like Photoshop brushes that can help us bring a much more artistic touch to our textures. So for example, I could click, select this rake here. I'm gonna add a new paint layer, drag it to the top. 
Whoops. Take the paint. Now it does a big old rake across our surface. Pick a splatter brush. Try the size of that. So some brushes are a bit more advanced than your typical uh, Photoshop brush. Uh, some brushes are called particle brushes. So for example, here is one called Leaks Heavy. And with a brush with it, it will use a particle sim to simulate drops of water falling down my model surface. This is just one of many examples of particle brushes. So if you have the time, check them out. They're pretty cool. But that's enough with special effects brushes. I want to find something that is very nice and painterly. One of my favorites is this simple one right here. Knife painting soft. It just lets you get nice soft brush strokes in there. Now you could of course paint with color. Come in, give it up in color. Just kind of layer these on, but you'll have no control over the color afterwards. So again, coming back to the idea of using fill layers, I'm going to delete my brush layer. I'm going to create a fill layer. Right click it and to add a black mask, the color of this fill player to black. Turn off all these other settings. I'm going to set the mode to multiply. Because just like Photoshop, you have all these different blending modes for your layers. I'm going to turn down the opacity of this to about 54. And then with that knife painting brush, I can come in. start painting. So my goal with going over this whole thing is to kind of give it a sort of custom painted surface without it being too distracting. I need to hit X. And now I can erase with that brush because I'm just painting on the mask. So now I'm painting black back onto the mask. Change my stroke opacity. Right now I'm just trying to show off the tools. I'm not really painting very seriously towards the final product yet. There, and just by going back and forth with my brush there, this has just a very slight kind of painted feel to it while still being very flat giving it a stylized look. I could go even further and do the same thing, create a fill layer with an overlay. Make it white. And add a black mask to that. So then we can come in with sort of a custom highlight. If you didn't want to use automatic ambient occlusion maps, you could paint them in like this and it could look really good. Just painting in your corners like this on your multiply layer. And there you go. That's a very quick way to paint in some texture to your model. Of course, it's not the only way to texture your model. Uh, it's really up to you. Every character is different and has different needs. Probably a good way to get some extra detail is to use smart masks, especially if you're 
custom painting your materials like this, you may want to employ some smart masks. Smart masks work just like regular masks, but they are generated via the mesh maps that we created earlier. So for example, I can add a new fill layer, give it a lower roughness, turn off the height, metal, maybe put color on a rough, make it, make it red just so you can really see it. And then let's add a cavity mask. And so now that smart mask is only going to fill in the cavities of this mesh. An important part of this mask is that it is using the ambient inclusion map, which we generated earlier to calculate where edges are close together and forming these cavities. So that an edge is strong. And that's kind of the opposite of the crevices one. This goes for anything where there's an edge. And in here, in this layer, you can select mask editor. So I can do things like change the global balance of this mask to make it more or less intense. Change the blur, the contrast. all kinds of different sliders you can change to get the look you want. And then no matter what, you're still going to have areas that are just not what you wanted. So you could further adjust this by going to your mask and right clicking right here in these sort of sub layers and adding paint. This is basically acts as sort of a layer for your mask, which is on your layer. And with paint selected, you can come in, turn back up my stroke opacity, 100%, and come in and paint out all these areas that you deem not useful. Paint out all these areas that are not accurate to the kind of edges you're looking for. Then I'm just going to go back, change this to a multiply, you now an overlay, change the color to white. Turn the opacity. There, now we've sort of automatically added a bit more detail to this collar. Turn off, on again. So definitely play around with these smart masks a lot. They are very helpful for you. I'm gonna make one more of these. I'm gonna use the dirt material. So I'm gonna give myself a nice brown. Turn off, turn on the height, roughness, give it a little more height, make it very rough. I'm gonna drag my dirt spots on top of this layer. And there's and I'm just going to edit this mask, just my contrast, just the balance. So curvature, if you see a slider titled curvature, that generally applies to those edges we talked about earlier. You see a lot of these sliders will share names with the mesh maps. So over time, you'll kind of get an understanding what each of those mesh maps does based on just playing with the sliders you find in Smart Materials. And so there's just a lot of different ways to really customize this dirt mask. 
Ultimately, I decide not to use it though because I want to maintain my painterly look. After a certain point, you'll figure out kind of your style and you'll probably apply the same technique all throughout. But your skin might need some special attention because skin naturally has some interesting properties. So going to smart materials, I'm going to start us off by applying the skin human simple material. Right, it starts me off with a pretty good skin material that has some things in it that are pretty accurate to real skin. But since this is kind of a stylist character, I'm likely going to turn some of these off. But I want to start, I just want to throw this on here and see what I do and don't want. So, for example, it included a layer called dots, which has some generated moles, which look really nice for regular skin, but not really great on a stylized character. So I'm going to go ahead and turn those off. It included its own ambient occlusion layer, which is pretty nice. I'll leave that on an extra level of ambient occlusion. I think it looks OK. So if you start turning some of these layers off, skin will not look quite right. But you may need to adjust those anyway. And if you want to adjust the tone of the skin, the first place to start would probably be the base layer. And you can move your way up the other layers and tweak those as well. So you get really close, you can see there's some of these veins going on. If you have a stylus character, you probably want to turn those off. Those are, are pretty uncanny up close. Same thing with this subsurface skin. Seems to be adding a lot of bumps and pores to the skin. I'm going to turn that off. And then there's a dots layer. I'm going to turn that off because it's just another detail I'm not in control of. Now I've got kind of a plasticky looking skin. So I'd want to maybe come back in with some painting to give it a texture. But what I do like is that it did give me a pretty good subsurface surface scattering. So if I turn that off, you'll see the effect that's having. Basically, subsurface scattering is the effect of light that passes through an object that is semi-transparent. So skin is a really good example of this because it's a little bit transparent. So that's an effect that we really, really want on skin to make it look convincing. So I'm going to leave my scattering on here. And then like I did with the shirt, I want to start painting in some texture. So I've made myself a new layer. I'm going in, turning off most of the properties except for color. And I'm going to pick a nice dark red because we want to keep up that a feeling of the skin being transparent. Then, like before, I'm going to add a black mask and then we can start painting on that mask to bring the red back in. Make it a multiply layer. 50% opacity. And go even lower than that, 19. And I'll just try to paint in a bit of detail. Nothing much, just trying to go back and forth to give it kind of a painterly texture. And I need to go back and change my stroke capacity for this to work right. There we go. Here is a good opportunity to paint in a clavicle shadow. So you can give the impression of clavicle bones underneath the skin. Same thing underneath the jaw. I can just use this to accentuate it a little bit and give it a little bit more shape. And then inside the ear is an especially good place to add some darkness to simulate more of that ambient inclusion. For the lips, I give myself a whole new layer and make it a darker red. And then I go in and paint in the lips 
before turning down the opacity on that layer to make it feel a bit more natural. And then similarly to the way I did the lips, I'm going to make a pink fill layer and I just start brushing that in onto my mask, particularly around her cheeks and anywhere else I think might be a little more red, just to make her feel a little more lively and painted. So while I was setting up my materials in Maya, I set the transmission of my cornea material to the maximum so I could still see my eyeball. However, that didn't translate into substance painter, so now my eyeball is hidden underneath the cornea. So while working on the eyeball, I'm just going to hide my cornea like this. And then I can go to my eyeball texture here and work on it normally. So because the geometry of the cornea and the eyeball are overlapping each other, when we baked our mesh maps, it calculated the eyeball as being very close to another piece of geometry. So it made it very dark and that's not what we want. So to fix this, I'm going to delete the ambient inclusion specifically on our eyeball material. Even if you don't have a cornea on your eyeball and you're not getting an entirely dark eyeball, you still want to get rid of the ambient occlusion on it because when your eyeball rotates in the skull, you're going to see those dark parts remain dark as it rotates around, and that's not really accurate to how actual ambient occlusion works. So like we've done before, I'm going to make a folder and put a mask on it for my iris color. And I'm going to use polygon select to get those specific polygons for my iris. And then after that, I'll give it a nice color. And then I'll repeat the process for my pupil as well. In your pupils properties, you want to set that height to the lowest possible value so that it looks like it goes inwards. And then you want to set the roughness to the maximum so there's no shine on it. Between those two settings, it should appear as though your pupil is a black void, which is the look we want since pupils are a hole in the eyeball itself. If you're anything like me, you'll probably hit B instinctually to go to your paintbrush tool, but that's not the hotkey for it in Substance Painter. Instead, B displays the next mesh map in your list of mesh maps. So to return to the normal material view, press the M key, or you can go to this drop down menu and find your material view there. And to finish it off, you can add just as much detail or as little detail as you want to the iris. It's nice to have a little bit of height variation in the iris just because when you look at an iris up really close, there's a lot of little tiny strands that give it a very fibrous texture that will really show up in your lighting. So I'm certainly not done texturing my character, but I think I've shown you guys enough that you can interpolate what you should do with your own characters. So the last thing for me to show you is how to export your textures. To do that, I'm gonna go up to File and Export Textures, and it gives me this export window. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through all my materials and I'm gonna turn off all the ones that I don't want to export to. And then back up here in global settings, I'm going to select my output directory. Now it's very important to double check your output directory because it's set by default to some random folder. And where you really want it to export to is your source images folder in your Maya project. And then once I'm in my source images folder, I'm gonna go ahead and add a subfolder to that and you can give it any name you want. So long as it's in your source images folder, it should work just the same. You'll just have to navigate one extra folder sometimes, but it's worth it because when you're exporting from Substance Painter, you tend to get a lot of textures. And if you have anything else in your Maya project folder, it's going to get very difficult to navigate. After that, you have the option to select a file type 
I'm going to leave it as a PNG. And then moving on, I'm going to just hop over to the Output Templates tab. And it's here that we can set up exactly what kinds of textures we're going to be exporting. So for example, I can click on this Unreal Engine template and I can see that it will export a base color texture, a normal map, an emissive texture, and a texture that combines the ambient occlusion, the roughness, and the metalness into one texture. And it does that by assigning each of those grayscale textures to the red, blue, and green channels of a single texture file. But you don't need to worry about that. That's just an example. You could also export to Unity or RenderMan or even Roblox. But today we're going to be exporting to Arnold AI Standard. And that comes with everything you would expect. It comes with a base color, a metalless, roughness, normal, height, and emissive textures. However, we are missing one thing we need, and that is a subsurface scattering map. So to get a scattering map going, we need to go up here to output maps, and we need to add a gray map. This adds a grayscale image to our list of outputs, but now we need to assign scattering to that grayscale map. So I'm gonna go over here and grab scattering and drag it to my grayscale map. And I'm going to select gray channel as opposed to a channel because A channel is the alpha channel and I don't want that. And then all I need to do is give it a name. So I'm going to copy this name from above. I'm going to paste it into my scattering map. Then I just need to replace the word emissive with scattering. And then I'm ready to go. Then I want to go up to my list of exports and hit save settings. And that will close my window. So I'll need to bring it up again with file export textures. And oh, it looks like my directory has reset itself. So always be sure to double check your directory and set it again if need be. And then I'll hit save settings from the settings tab and then open export textures again. And it retains my proper directory. So always keep an eye on that. Then going back to output templates, it reset my template. So set it back to Arnold. And yeah, just really double check all these settings multiple times because it's easy for them to get reset for whatever reason. Finally, on your list of exports tab, you can take one last look to review every single texture that will get exported. And then you can hit export. And it'll take a second to make all the files. And then once it's done, go ahead and look in your source images folder and there should be all of your textures. Then all that's left to do is to plug them back into your materials back in Maya. Substance Painter is a very extensive program and so there's still a huge wealth of information that I wasn't able to touch on in this video, but this should be enough to make some really nice materials for your characters. So with that, I wish you good luck and I'll see you next time.